So thank you all for coming. Uh, this is like our fourth founder meetup, and uh, to be honest, it's finally uh, one about uh, uh, something that's very near and dear to my heart, which is, of course, developer tools. Uh, it's hard to put a panel in Croatia about that, but I'm really glad I, I got it together. Uh, it's also our first panel, so we usually do conversations one-on-one -on -one with VCs, uh, but this one uh, actually randomly came together Last time, Antonia from, from uh, uh, InfoBip Shift or uh, Shift Mag, whatever it is that it's called nowadays, kind of suggested the idea, uh, and uh, I, I'm really glad uh, we did it. One thing that you'll notice, uh, I kind of keep uh, forgetting to say this, you'll have these uh, uh, pretty faces of all of these gentlemen on, 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 on your lanyards, but also there's a QR code. That QR code should theoretically uh, 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 give uh, that information to anybody who scans it. You don't need to download an app. You don't need to do anything. Basically, you'll, you'll share your phone number, email, company, or whatever information we were able to scrape out of internet uh, about all of you uh, uh, right here. Uh, so uh, you can grab beers. I, I think that there's everywhere. Uh, 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 and pizza is being baked. It's probably going to come around 8, uh, 8 p.m., uh, there is Coke water, but there's an incident with like Roma Quelle, so I, I, I think our lawyer is still not here, so let's not drink Coke until, uh, until the lawyer comes or, or something like that. Uh, and there's a cafe below us, or uh, there are now two, uh, so after we kind of finish and wrap up here around 10, uh, 10 p.m., if somebody wants to go drinking or, or just like generally uh, partying, you can go uh, uh, below. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, probably not to you, right? Uh, I will, of course. I, every time <laughs> I go to the party. Uh, so, so kind of the idea uh, behind every every single one of these is to kind of distill one one particular topic. So, for today, we I'd like to kind of help everybody here and to a degree even myself uh, understand how do you turn like a developer project or a side project that that you might be working on into an actual business. What does it take? How can you do it? Should you get funding? Are all VCs evil? And, and you know, how to actually make uh, uh, money uh, off of that? So uh, I've got three speakers and I'm going to let them talk, uh, uh, give them kind of an intro on their own. So starting from my left, we've got Tunia for 500. And please feel free to kind of uh, plug 500 or, or anything that you want to talk about. Of course. Um, hi, everyone. I think I met with like most of you. Um, my name is Tunya. I am from 500 Emerging Europe. We are deploying a 70 million euros fund. Uh, we are focusing on early stage companies from idea stage to, uh, you know, like every sub stages of an early stage, probably we are very flexible. Um, and we are focusing on Central Eastern Europe and Turkey. Uh, we have been deploying this fund since the beginning of 2021. Uh, this is our second fund. We had our first fund, which was deployed between 2015 and 2020, and we had three unicorns out of our portfolio. And now we're actively investing in the region. We had our first creation uh, startup in our portfolio, <laughs> Daytona. Uh, and Congrats. we are still, thank you. <laughs> we are still actively looking for um, opportunities. Um, and see, yeah, I'm, I'm an investment associate at our fund, and I think that's it from my side. Nice. And we've got Amir from Cubinet, and probably a lot of you know him from uh, Vespa. So please feel free to plug anything you want. Yeah. Uh, well, um, kind of my history and the background, I spent 12 years uh, working with uh, InfoVip since the beginning, uh, till when it became uh, pretty large, about 3,000 people when I left. Uh, and uh, after that, um, my kind of path was that I wanted to have a startup and uh, I wanted to start a startup, uh, but there was no any kind of infrastructure in Croatia. So I started up the place for startups called Vespa Spaces. Uh, we now host about 120 companies there and 650 people is working from the, from the space. And from there, I also started another startup, which is called Kubinets, uh, where we build uh, uh, automation for data infrastructure. Uh, basically, we are trying to help uh, developers to self-serve uh, cloud resources such as databases and um, event streaming engines and so on in a very user-friendly way in a couple of minutes instead of uh, uh, days or weeks or waiting for your DevOps team. 
and uh, that project raised uh, um, million, million and a half euros uh, since we started. Uh, we started about 12 months back. Uh, the first project uh, with Vespa is now two and a half million euros uh, in revenue uh, in third year of uh, business. So that's kind of my uh, background uh, working with um, unicorns and starting startups. Nice. And last but not least is definitely Mattia. So feel hey. free uh, to kind of give us an intro and tell us more about Wasp. Awesome. Thank you all. I'm Mattia from Wasp. Uh, so we are developing an open source full stack web framework. So just a quick question. How many of you are developers? <laughs> okay, I, I won't go super deep. Uh, but yeah, we are open source as we are covering today. And we are building a so full stack framework for building web apps, uh, currently supporting React and Node.js. Shortly about us, so we are here for about three years. We got uh, basically funded by Y Combinator and a bunch of other uh, deep tech investors. And yeah, that's pretty much it. We are in beta now, enter beginning of the year. We have about 25,000 applications created with Wasp and now pushing towards 1.0. So happy to chat about everything. Nice, we'll uh, thank you all for coming, uh, especially Tunia. I know you drove from Budapest. I know a couple of people, uh, Ivo, you drove from Austria, so thank you for that, and a couple of other places. I really appreciate everybody coming, uh, and uh, we'll get into the questions after uh, we're finished. You can ask any question you want to anybody here, uh, and again, uh, uh, we'll all mingle after, uh, after this. So because Mattia was last, now you get to go first. Uh, I'm going to ask the same question to, uh, uh, to Amir as well, and then we'll, we'll try something else for Tunia. By the way, this is my first time uh, moderating a panel, so let's see how I do. Uh, you're saying that every time you're moderating. No, no, I, no, no, no. I, I don't say that. Uh, when I do one-on-ones, I, I say that I'm a pro at this moment. So, so yeah. So, Matia, I'm sure many people here have, uh, or generally, many people have like a ton of ideas. Some are probably good, but probably most of them suck, uh, including my own. Uh, how? do you figure out which one of those ideas is good enough to start building a, a company from? I'm, I'm basically looking, if you look back to Wasp, what was that specific moment? Like, was it something that, you know, your customers told you about or did it solve your own need? Or how did you kind of mm -hmm. go from, hey, this is a really nice idea to I think I could actually build a business or maybe even get funding for it? Mm -hmm. Sure. I think one thing is to have an idea. But also, you know, depends what you want to do with it. One thing is if you want to have a VC funded project, which means it has to be like a market big enough, scalable enough. But on the other hand, if you are not interested necessarily into going the VC route, it can still be a good idea for that. So I would say that is one factor to consider. And on the other hand, what you said, basically you should solve a problem, right? And, you know, it doesn't even have to start always with a problem. It can be a technological, you know, thing that you're excited about and want to try, which is how many, you know, developer tools start. And that's totally legit way. Although, you know, like there's all customer development and stuff, but typically, you know, you plug that in later and then you make it work. Yeah. <laughs> so I would say there are multiple ways to start a project and it's, it's both good to start with a problem and then build on that or start with something interesting. I think it's always good, you know, some people say, I think, uh, you know, in, in the beginning, you don't, you don't even call it a startup. You just say, hey, I'm, I'm doing an experiment. I'm doing this And that's why yeah, people yeah. are not going to judge you and say, yo, the market is not big enough, you don't <laughs> fund it, you know, this doesn't work. You know, you can do your experiment and say, as long as you are aware of what you are doing and what your goal is, then you know you can actually see what happens. I think that's the best way to, to approach it. When you when you landed on the Wasp idea, was it like oh instantly, you know I know this is it, or did it kind of did you let it sour for a bit and kind of grow on you? Yeah, I mean definitely. You know we had a full time job when when we started, and it kind of sounded you know star, sounded crazy in the beginning, which is what got us attracted to it. <laughs> so this is basically you know we just started started developing the idea first while keeping our jobs, and then slowly you know it uh, it kind of transformed into something something more. Cool. What about you, Amir? How how did Kubernetes uh, uh, became a reality? What was it for you guys? I think uh, characteristic of a good idea is that it's a building block of amazing idea. And uh, <laughs> the, uh, we had experience building big data platforms like, uh, you know, as the agency. Um, and one of the things that we did uh, for, for one of the countries here in the, in the region is the project that cost of like 200,000 euros resulted in about 110 million euros in saving for their uh, government. And uh, that gave us uh, kind of inspiration that, you know, if you could make 
hundreds of these projects to make it really easy for companies to uh, attend technology, then, uh, you know, just there's a big, big disparity between the cost and result that they can uh, achieve with uh, um, uh, with big amounts of data. And that was kind of motivator to, to build Kubernetes because we see it as a catalyst uh, to, to put data in action. Uh, if you can speed up the whole process, make it much cheaper and make it much more uh, appealing to the average uh, company, um, then you can make uh, much more impact. So. Yeah, I, I think that uh, uh, kind of context that uh, we have experienced something amazing and then we try to improve uh, a part of it, uh, which then leads to scaling of amazing things is what was the driver to, to think that uh, th this might be a really good idea. Cool. Uh, Tunia, I know you're, you're not building uh, products necessarily, but uh, 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 you probably, not probably, we've talked about it, you hear a lot of ideas uh, on a daily basis. So you also kind of try to figure out what is a good idea, what is a bad idea, especially from an investment side. Are there any early signs that you guys look for to kind of classify, hey, this is interesting, this is not interesting, this is good, this is bad? And what what would those be? Do they match anything that, that these guys said? <laughs> of course. I, I, actually, they, they explained perfectly the two way of building a dev tool. As far as I, I've seen, of course, like as, as you said, I'm not building. I'm just, by the way, waiting for this to become my roasting part. <laughs> <laughs> they won't, they won't. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is the one that Mattia explains that like you, as a developer, like uh, come up with an idea coming from your own pain point, maybe like Retool started like that, Ruby on Rails started like that, Terraform started like that. Um, and like what Amir explains, also we've seen this in our portfolio, especially we see, see this model, like you become an agency, like a service provider, and then you productize at least like some, some part of, the, of your idea into a product. So yeah, the, these are like two two amazing expla uh, you know explanations of the, to, of the way, and I think this ha th this uh, creates an amazing baseline on on your product, and you can build on top of it because you're you're, you're aware of that pain point. Um, for us, like the early signs, I, actually this is this is exactly the early sign that we are looking for. If you are like have a have a perfect grasp of what you're building and what why you're building. Uh, I, I think that's a perfect, perfect starting point for us. So um, I think out of all our, all the dev tools in our portfolio, which actually, com, you know, comprise, I mean, our, our portfolio is like, I don't know, like maybe half of it is, they're related to the B2B and like majority of them are, you know, related to the dev tool market. And I think this is, this has become like two, two ways actually we have seen in the portfolio. Um, like the early signs may be, I don't know, like the quick developer adoption, like GitHub stars and, you know, some, some metrics and why? No, no, we'll talk about, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about I, GitHub I stars. I haven't checked your questions. You, you sent them last night. I said, them, well, 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 I gave you enough time, so. <laughs> I was driving. Yeah, uh, um, yeah I mean, of course, okay, sorry. We'll, we'll get asking. to get those stars. No, but, but uh, I think this is an interesting subject. Uh, what, what kind of, uh, I wouldn't call them uh, dumb, but some simple indicators that uh, something will uh, have traction. You, you mentioned the uh, uh, GitHub stars. What, what else are simple indicators that someone who is not from the industry? I, understand? you know, um, I, I think there, there is not a particular metric that I look for, but like personally, I think my uh, reflex, at least that I, that I uh, improved, was the to you know take a look at the commit in on, on GitHub, mm -hmm. like the number of commits, like or you know, like the, the variety of people who are committing to to the code base. I think this is what I look. Yeah. Contributors, yeah. Yeah, contributors, Forks, issues, yeah. and also I, I sometimes you know I, I check GitHub a lot, like maybe like a lot more than an average VC. I always like check at least like to check ch check the most most favorite contributors or you, you know the, the projects. And sometimes I, I, I kind of look at like for example like CNCF, like who are the contributors and to to. Like for example, like Apache Foundations, the different projects, different database projects, etc. So um, sometimes, the, like uh, you can see some some startups like contributing to other open source projects. This is also a good sign, good 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 sign of because like they actually build 
peripheries around around these tools, and they can kind of uh, open source their technology and then it sell upon like periphery, which also we have seen we see some examples in the portfolio as well. If it's not open source, I assume that it's like data that we send you in and tell you, hey, we've got X amount of uh, adoption, X amount of users, retention, or something like. Sure. That. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so on that note. Uh, when do you like uh, to hear from startup? Is it like at the idea stage? Is it when they have like a, an MVP? Is it when something is on GitHub and they've got a ton of contributors? Like, I feel like a lot of founders, especially maybe that I talked to out of Croatia, I think like it has to be perfect. Uh, otherwise, we won't get like an investment uh, if it's not perfect the first time. Yeah. So, I, I think this is what I, I'm very proud of our fund. Because we have this approach where we um, we would like to be there as soon as they as soon as founders decide on building something, and we would like to start supporting them even at, a, at an idea stage. And we have seen like so many examples from from our portfolio as well. We have invested massively in in idea stages, and actually this is this is our sweet one of our sweet spots at least. So this is why actually we do something that we call talent mapping. For example, we. Uh, try to reach out to people who are contributing to these open source projects. This is why I actually check like constantly these foundations, um, open source project contributors, so that I can reach out to them if they are in our mandates and like okay. try to understand if they are kind of building, you know, try to build or like decided on building something. Um, so yeah, as as soon as possible, it's the answer. Okay, cool. Uh... I mean, for you guys, how long, uh, same question, by the way, uh, to, to Matia, how long did each of you spend developing the first version of your product? Was it, you know, months, weeks, years? Did you release fast? Was it like, was it, are you, were you trying to make it perfect or was it like, hey, let's just push it out there. Let's see what it is and let's see what the feedback yeah, is. Yeah, we didn't. Uh, <laughs> we, did, we, did, we made a big mistake. Um, we, we have based our strategy on the on the idea that we will fundraise and what we did uh, in the first instance is to uh, we have created a mock-up uh, product which is awesome. something that we shouldn't have uh, okay. done we, we should have gone straight to the um, mvp uh, so the mock-up took about uh, two months and then uh, mvp took about uh, three to four months uh, we could have saved two two months uh, if we went straight to the um, mvp uh, but because of the complexity of the product, our MVP was equally complex. Um, so the idea was that we'll start with the, with the mock-up mock -up and uh, start spreading the idea with the uh, investors. And now if we uh, you know, had to do it uh, all over again, we would uh, go straight to the uh, MVP. Um, it didn't take uh, too long uh, all the time, but it was uh, pretty intensive. It was uh, pretty uh, complex and uh, yeah, still, it's still not working uh, as it should. It's, it's better. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of a lot of errors uh, happening. So I, I think um, maybe just in uh, in principle, uh, if you're not going in the direction that you are uh, acquiring um, interest uh, through through uh, uh, GitLab, I think uh, just mocking up the uh, uh, the product and then uh, gouging the interest of the market and uh, investors is is a good first step. I don't think you have to have the MVP to uh, prove people that uh, something is working. I don't think that the question is can you build something. The question is if you build it. Uh, will it have any kind of traction on the on the market? And you can explore that even without the MVP. MVP will not help exploring the uh, traction because no one will buy product that is not completely uh, functional. So yeah, that's uh, kind of my experience. I know you guys, uh, YC kind of prides itself on building fast. Was that something that uh, did you guys did early on, like released Wasp pretty fast or? Yeah, I mean, even before YC, we started, like, I think one year before YC, we actually kind of were almost full time working on it. So for us, I mean, we wanted to release as fast as possible. And I mean, that's the main advice that everybody will say, and I agree. And I think when we kind of started working seriously on it, it was a couple of months. And then we released the first possible version. So it wasn't actually even, I mean, it was working, but you had to download <laughs> the source code in Haskell, compile it yourself. So <laughs> it was more about just the landing page. <laughs> it was working if you were willing to, to make it work. <laughs> no, but we actually, the, boy, the main idea was just to have a landing page and basically show the message. Hey, we are building a new language for this, this, and this, and this is what we launched. So even that already got like a nice amount of feedback. And then basically after a couple more months, uh, we actually had like a bigger launch on Prohan, Hacker News, Reddit, and that's what got us yeah, in the end in, in the YC. Nice. 
By the way, I think you said six months. Uh, I, I also, I think I spent building treble even more. I think like before we went uh, all in, I think I, I spent like a year on and off. Uh, yeah, that, that also, in. I mean, yeah. Yeah, so six months, including a mock-up is, <laughs> is, is rapid. <laughs> yeah, but for example, we, we didn't release the, the product with PR and uh, marketing. Uh, I think we, we have this uh, uh, kind of approach. We, we want to see how complicated is it to build this kind of product. Okay. Uh, before we uh, release it to the uh, to the public. Okay, cool. Uh, so uh, Tunya is probably gonna think that all the other questions I'm gonna ask are probably all about uh, roasting her or generally VCs. But really, I, I know some people are are generally interested. It means. So we'll start. We'll start with Mati and then go back to you. So you build the MVP. It's up and running. What do you do next? Uh, was Fundraising, even like uh, uh, on, on, in your, on your radar, is that what you wanted to do? Uh, I feel like there's a lot of stigma, and we'll, we'll, we'll ask Tunya about this as well, especially in the developer community, that for some reason, people think we see or, or any investor is going to come to you as a developer and tell you, hey, you need to do this using TypeScript and not something else, or hey, you should do, use Ruby on Rails versus PHP, or I don't know. Uh, do you, what was the path for you there? Yeah, I mean, we are developing Haskell, so I think, you know, that, that says enough. <laughs> yeah. no, I'm just kidding, yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I think you, first you have to decide what you want to do. Like, are you even interested in, you know, venture capital, or is it just going to be, I was just on the panel the other, the other day, and one developer used, you know, like a word, word, like, this project is my house plant, you know. So it's like a library or something, which I never will maybe, like, be huge or grow big, okay. but it's going to be, like, integral part of other libraries. And basically, you know, I can get sponsorships, I can just, you know, work on it, connect, it, collaborate, and stuff, stuff like that. So that's one thing, but for us specifically, you know, we decided to build a whole new web framework. Okay. So it's a pretty kind of you know, solution in one. And because of the approach we took, building our own compiler, our own specification language around it, we knew it's going to take a lot of time and we knew you know, we can do it part time. So for us, that was the main reason why we decided for, for VC funding. And also we knew about YC, we knew that they have a lot of open source companies and they know what they're, do they're doing there. So that was the main motivator for us uh, to apply. I've been thinking about it uh, recently about time, and I feel like uh, the, the role of a founder is literally to buy time for the company until you figure it out, uh, either sales or the product, uh, one of those two, so you either hit it or don't. But essentially, you're buying time at the end of the uh, uh, day. What about you, Amir? Uh, what was, uh, you, you already kind of hinted that you guys uh, uh, wanted to go the investor route. Uh, was it a similar approach? Do you, did you think it's going to need a lot of resources, a lot of time? And uh, were you afraid that they're going to tell you, hey, don't do this, don't do that? Yeah. No, we were not afraid of what they will say. I don't think that uh, really matters because you can always say no. And I think it's fair to have your say and have even better if you have the arguments against something that uh, someone is suggesting. I don't think that there is a situation where someone will suggest something and that will have detrimental effect. Uh, it can only be helpful because it's another perspective to, to consider. Um, but I think, uh, again, mistake that, that we did, we went uh, pretty early into fundraising uh, without uh, product, without uh, revenue, with a uh, great idea because we were convinced that it's a great idea. And somehow I think uh, <laughs> it, was, it, it was partially emotional as well because it's coming, you know, like, uh, look at this. It's just amazing. You know, if we build this, then we can build hundreds of those and uh, sounds pretty uh, convincing to us. And, uh, you know, we'll be able to convince others. Uh, but it seems that, uh, you know, having uh, the idea and the uh, passion is not uh, the main driver for the uh, investors. And uh, <laughs> that's fine. That's, uh, well, that's, yeah, I answered that. That, that, that's absolutely uh, acceptable. That's something that we learned uh, along the way. And I don't think that uh, we have lost anything in the in the process because it's not like uh, we would develop, develop or implement more code if we didn't uh, fundraise. And I don't, I don't think that, um, you know, founder should be the one writing the code and uh, creating the product uh, himself. There are more important uh, methods to, to attend, uh, you know, from running a company to uh, creating a brand and uh, creating networking within the industry and so on. Um, yeah, from, from that side, side I think uh, I, I often uh, say that uh, building a company and building a product are two equally challenging uh, um, uh, jobs and you have to have a team that is building a product and you have to have founders team that is building a, a company and when you join these two things to, together, then it becomes something uh, investable. So, yeah, that's uh, from my perspective. So, Tunya, do 
investors actually tell uh, founders uh, what tech to use? Like, should, you know, did you ever tell anybody use GraphQL instead of REST or something like that? Uh, <laughs> why do you think that stigma even exists, especially in the developer community? Like, to the best of my ability, I feel like sometimes uh, you guys might ask about results in terms of sales, and then everybody's like, oh, shit, VCs are telling us what to do. Uh, uh, is it because of that, or what's, what's kinda, what do you think the, the logic behind that is? I think uh, there are a lot of st stigmas <laughs> around <laughs> VCs. Um, but, you know, the mo most importantly, as a generalist VC, I don't think we have even the right to interfere with, especially with the product itself. Of course, as you said, like, we hear a lot of things, right? I mean, as you know, like, every day I, I see at least, like, five, com five different companies. I talk to five different companies, so I need to get to know their market, get to know their competition. And they're, like, so idiosyncratic market conditions that I need to know about. So whenever I, I you know, see these markets and, like, you know, like read content, listen to the content. I, I see a lot of things. So of course, like I, I share share them with the founders and then I, I can I kinda tell them like you can you can use this, you can use that and your competitors is doing competitors are doing this or that. But never I, I can like uh, suggest anything or interfere with anything, especially regarding product development of course. And I, I have I don't have the knowledge. Like uh, sometimes people are su surprised when I say I, I know coding, but I'm not a developer, <laughs> uh, so I, I'm not sure if uh, if I even can uh, do that. But um, yeah, I, I've I've seen this stigma like a lot. Um, I think not not only for the for the dev dev tool space, but also like in, in general, there's this uh, there's this fear that investors will interfere like too much, and I, I think unfortunately that that's the case with a lot of investors. Especially in, in emerging markets, I also s saw these kind of cases. But I think that the gist of it is that you need to find the right investor, even even if they you would like them to interfere, like which is which is kind of okay if you like them to interfere with you. Which is, I mean, for me not okay. But I I, I think in general, if you like some advisors and investor, also you, you can you can do that. But for for this or you know in in general you need to find the right investor for to to you know become your partner in, in the journey because this is like a marriage right i mean it's, uh they they'll stay in your life uh, from like 5 to 10 years at least so uh yeah i would just like to uh, add something she she uh, is part of kind of, kind of uh, thinking i don't think that investors are suggesting things i think they're trying to learn uh things and then they're exploring different uh, information from different sources and uh, that could seem a suggestion, but it's more like probing uh, why would you think that one is better than uh, another? I think it's a learning process, which is normal for them. And then, then they become desensitized to, uh, you know, asking questions, which is absolutely <laughs> normal. And then it comes across as suggesting something. I don't think it's suggesting. I think it's more... Yeah, by, by the way, I, I do this not only to our portfolio companies, but also for, to, yeah, but to the founders that I know. I think it's misunderstood. It's misunderstood as a suggestion. Do you, do you misunderstand? <laughs> When I share share so, content, I, so, I I will not if you so no, no, <laughs> take no, no, it no, like no. that. I usually I'm the guy I, I'm the guy asking the question. So whatever you say, you know, I ask the question. So it's on me if I if I how I take it. But I did have like a couple of interesting suggestions that I got not from you was actually U.S. based investors, especially let's say SF related. I think it was like two thousand early two thousand twenty two. They were like, you're using PHP. Like, are you sure that's, that's the right, <laughs> right tool? I'm like, why not? He's like, nobody I know uses it. Like, none of our portfolio companies are building in PHP. How will you hire? How will you do this? How will you do that? I'm like, I don't know. We'll figure it out. But I don't think it should matter. So, so uh, suffice it to say, I, I don't talk to them. <laughs> not because of that. <laughs> not because of that. But I think that, like I said, there, there is a misconception in, in some cases. But it wasn't because of PHP, the language. It was actually because they were trying, the point they were, they were trying to make, look, I don't know anybody who does this, you know, and we have a pretty big pool of talent that does JavaScript, that does Java, that does something else. So maybe that was kind of the suggestion. But, uh, you yeah. know. I mean, if, again, like it, it's only based on benchmarks, right? Exactly. For example, exactly. I, I've seen, I don't know when it happened, like I think it, like three, four months ago, uh, but I, I saw that one of the competitors, like actually, maybe I might have even heard it, like from a podcast or something, that they're using Angular, which is like more scalable. So I kind of told 
the founder of the portfolio company. <laughs> like, it's it's on on him to take it or not. And no? did, 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 <laughs> Don't burst anyone. Did, did he listen to can you? Can we can we cut this? Okay. Yeah, of course, of course. Did he listen to you? Um, I, I'm. I don't even know. Like, I, I don't. I, I, I don't. Did you? Know. <laughs> as soon as you heard it, did you just like text it out and be like, "Hey, these guys are talking about Angel." Yeah, I, I, I sent sent him the link and. Why well, I shouldn't do that? No, 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 no. It's okay. I'm just asking. Was it a sa Saturday or, or Sunday? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. I consume con. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, cool. Well. Look, I think a lot of people here, uh, and there are people here that, that I even spoke to, like, I think it comes down to you as, as a founder as well. Like, it's up to you to, dis you know, dissect what advice is good advice, what advice is bad advice. I don't think you guys ever have bad intentions. It's all about, hey, we think this is happening, or we think this might be important, or we think this, or we think that. Uh, I've never come across anybody who said you have to do this, like... None of our VCs ever came to us and told me you have to do this or you have to. Like two years ago, uh, our, our seed uh, investor, they, they basically uh, said, Vedran, observability is going to be a thing. I didn't even know about the word. And I'm like, yeah, yeah sure, sure. Uh, and uh, we, we asked a couple of developers, they're like, what do you mean observability? You mean monitoring? I'm like, exactly. Nobody knows what observability <laughs> means. Turns out observability is becoming <laughs> kind of a, a very popular thing. Yes, so we have, we have two observability companies. <laughs> there the you go. It's, it's, it's one of those things. And she was right. And I, I, I told her that many, many times. And now we're doing you know, a lot of observability. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it's really interesting uh, a subject is semantics in uh, when you're creating something new. Yeah. You're coming up with all sorts of semantics and then people are uh, uh, understanding that in different ways. And then you get companies which uh, develop observability as one thing. Another co company yeah. is developing the same concept as another thing. It depends on how people understand it because there's no like uh, previously described, uh, you know, meaning of uh, that kind of uh, semantic for, for, for the industry or in that kind of application. Uh, Mattia, I feel like kind of every dev tool has some kind of a North Star metric, uh, or at least you try to find it. Uh, what was it for you guys? How did you measure early on uh, uh, growth? Uh, was it number of users, retention? We'll talk about the dreaded GitHub stars. I was saving that question for Tunia, but you can mention, you can start off if you wanted to. Yeah, pretty much. I think it, it's pretty similar to any other product, actually. I mean, in the end, it's always users, right? Yeah. You want to have successful users, then you just have to define you know, what, it, what it means for your product and then also your stage. So for example, for us is currently, you know, our North Star metric is number of users, like weekly active or monthly active, it doesn't matter. But that's because you know, we don't have monetization yet, so we cannot actually, I mean, the end goal for us would be for somebody to deploy an app with Wasp and happily run it in production. And maybe we'll pay us for the service if we have it in similar. But since we are in beta and we don't have paid features yet, then you know the more similar proxy to that is actually somebody you know using Boss, building something with it. I so wish we were at your stage. <laughs> it's the best stage ever. Uh, and what about you, Amir? Uh, yeah, we don't have users, so it's pretty easy. <laughs> right. So you know, if people are coming to work, it's, it's a good uh, metric. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's also there. <laughs> Do you have users or not, like binary? You shouldn't say that, by the way. This is good at yeah, users. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, I guess you would know one of the very important important metrics is that your bank is working. Yeah, <laughs> ah, I, agree. I agree. I agree. I agree. That's a that's a direct dig, dig at me, but yeah, yeah. On a stage, you have to keep yourself happy with small things. By the way, uh, I listened on the bank. I did listen to my VCs uh, when when we were doing the second investment. I asked them like. What bank? You know, nobody, nobody is gonna give us a, a bank account in uh, uh, in America without KYC. And I'm like, do you, can you recommend anybody? SVB, SVB. I'm gonna hook you up. It's gonna be SVB, and they did hook us up. <laughs> so we are, so, we are cutting these like, yeah, last yeah, yeah. two minutes just yeah. to. <laughs> so uh, coming back uh, uh, to you, Tunya. Uh, when you want to invest, when you're interested in a startup and you want to invest, I'm sure you as well are looking for, for metrics. And uh, I'm just going to say this. I feel like GitHub stars were, were a hit in 2022, but I'm kind of thinking based on everything everybody said that it's still uh, uh, relevant. So what is the new trend for you guys? What, what are you looking for? Uh, because again, 
GitHub stars is, is so easily gainable, number one. You can actually apply it on, on basically non-open source things. Or should we all kind of build something open source and then try to kind of uh, have that as well? Um, in terms of metrics, of course, like GitHub stars is the one that like strongly at least like sig signals uh, for for a good developer adoption. But of course, like you, as, as you said, like there are like several ways of getting Git GitHub stars, right? You can you can you know push it on like product hunt, like Hacker News, and you can you know just uh, you know, start gathering interest from from these users, and then they kind of push that button. It's which is like not hard. But actually, I I kind of you know while talking to developers, I I also um, discovered that like pushing pushing that button is not something that they do like you know for in in <laughs> vain. Like this is like some kind it's kind of sacred for them. All right. Yeah, I mean. Um, I, I I don't want to tell you like why I, I discovered that, but uh, it's like a funny story. I will I will tell You're you in person. You're among friends. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean this is kind of sacred for them. So I kind of, at least like for now I I I will start I I will keep trusting it. But of course, like I I try to understand where th these stars are coming from. Is this like a really a, or you know like product hunt, like hacker news push, or is this just really like a pr product led growth in terms of GitHub? Stuff? Are you using some tool to analyze? No, no. I I just do my own research. I I'm also always on hacker news, always on product hunt. I always like check check these products and I, I know whenever I, a founder from my network like pushes on product hunt and hacker news, I kind of check these GitHub stars, especially if I would like to invest in them in the future. If this is like a, you know, so much push or like it's, it's, if it's like an extremely um, hard increase, I always check it like within this time frame, like what, what happened. I, I also also uh, ask them like, what the fuck is happening to our GitHub stars? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I ask this like infinitely many times to, to founders, of course. Yeah. I think both of you kind of uh, answered this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway, and I'm just going to give a comment. Uh, uh, Please do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so growing a developer tool, marketing a developer tool, let alone selling a developer tool, has to be probably one of the hardest things I've ever attempted to do and am still doing, uh, uh, you know, so how important is it for you guys or do you, does that keep you awake, like trying to figure out marketing strategy, growth strategies, distribution channels, uh, are, are you guys thinking about sales, uh, uh, is that frightening to you, if you will, or? Um, shall I go you first? Go, yeah. yeah, I mean, all what you said, you know, pretty, pretty much. But yeah, I mean, developer marketing is an important part of developing you know, product because if nobody knows about your product, they, they will not use it. So for us, I mean, it's kind of scary in a way because if, you know, developers are judging you, everybody's looking at you. But in the other way, it's also very satisfying, especially you know, once you embrace you know, the gift of feedback and basically launching as early as possible, as much as possible. So I would say you know, it can also be very empowering. I can talk more about strategies, whatever, but I think, you know, it's, I, my conclusion is just, it's very important and basically it's something that should be done full time. Did you, I, I think you said that you're focusing more on, on growth. Are you thinking about sales uh, uh, at all? At sure, sure. I mean, we are always kind of, you know, like, uh, let's say, putting together the picture for the future. Okay, yeah. Because exactly. it's always good to kind of know what's your plan, what are your, we are not at that stage yet, but we're always learning from others, uh, seeing what everybody else is doing and kind of making our own projections. I think, Amir, you guys have a, a, a different path, right? You guys are already selling or trying to sell. Yeah, I think that um, it's really important to design a product that people want to buy instead of designing a product and then trying to sell it. And that's the major difference in uh, what we're trying to, to do. Uh, my and uh, my uh, co-founder's background is kind of, we are both engineers, but we, are, we had the history in sales. And we know how hard it is to sell something that, uh, you know, your product team comes up with. And then you're trying to convince someone that, you know, this is the greatest idea ever. Yeah. And I think that the, the better approach is that, you know, what you're actually doing is just take time. And instead of, you know, spending like 80% of time trying to sell something, spend the time uh, selling, but in a way where uh, clients can give you feedback. And actually, I would like to change the answer to the previous question. One of the ways how we are measuring how well we are doing how much feedback we are getting on a, a product that we present. Because if you're getting feedback, if you're getting the ideas, if you're inspiring people to uh, 
tell you what else you could do to uh, incrementally improve the, the product, this means that you're probably doing a, a good way in you know designing 90% of product yourself and then 10% in uh, collaboration with uh, with your clients. And I think the the best way to to do uh, to to empower sales is to design a product that uh, a customer wants to, uh, want to buy. And the um, problem there is to, to create bridge between the sales and the engineering. And this is where I think founders have the biggest role to actually uh, not make it a bridge, but actually uh, keep it connected and be kind of product managers and uh, talk with the client, see what they say and uh, change the product. And then on top of that, pivot a business strategy. Because uh, I was actually thinking when you say developer product, you have already defined a buying persona. And then that's a problem because you have already <laughs> narrowed down that you have to have, you know, this is the person that is buying. And uh, ultimately, maybe like 95% of uh, uh, developers in organizations do not have access to buying a uh, process. Uh, they don't have access to the credit card or, you know, whatever happens. And then you have, you have done something which is actually pretty hard to convert into paying uh, users. And I think because of that, you have to be flexible on both product and business uh, go to market strategy and be able to pivot in uh, every step of the way until you find what is uh, what's actually working. I agree, and uh, if I could just save everybody like an, a year of, of, of time and just like developers don't buy anything, period. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's not developers, it's probably somebody else, like Amir said, there's no budget, they don't have access to it, they're not interested, they're not decision makers, it's somebody else. So I just saved everybody here, uh, hopefully uh, some time, and you can focus on somebody else except a developer. Uh, but yeah, I totally agree uh, with, with bo what both of you in a way said. And I think it's very early. Uh, uh, it's important to kind of start thinking about it very early because then, then you're prepared, like you said. We just one, uh, one thing, my favorite thing about uh, sales strategy is that you're not selling a product, you're selling uh, some kind of emotion. And it sounds really, um, um, you know, um, how would I put it? Um, simplistic, but you have to find someone who will actually have some kind of emotion related to your product. And typically developers are not those people. They're interested, <laughs> you know, in, in list of features and that's uh, that's great. But if you have a manager that has, uh, you know, emotional problem with the fact that people are leaving his company and that he has to, uh, uh, you know, start projects over and over again, there is a tool that is helping uh, with retaining some of the code and so on. This is kind of emotion that you can, that you can uh, exploit to get this manager to buy a product and implement the organization and have developer uh, I agree. to use it. This is kind of uh, my Let opinion. alone, it took me a year to figure out that you can market to one person and sell to another person. Yeah, so maybe, maybe I'm, I'm slow. slow yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and actually, I had the, in Infoip, I had this uh, experience working with um, one organization that uh, created a sales process for LinkedIn and uh, Amazon and, and for others. And there, everything was about the emotion. So the customer stories always had an name and location and they had even time of the day because all of that kind of invoked the emotion in, uh, in listener and it was much less about features of the product it, it was much more about experience of the people that were around the product and how how that improved their you know quality of life and that was kind of driver to look at the features and i think uh, you know obviously they know what what they're doing and that's a way to to go to somehow elevate yourself beyond the product and we don't i know that we are all tied to you know what we are spending 90 percent uh, of time with and actually uh, try to understand what drives the other side okay uh, Tunya, we've talked about this uh, a bit before, but I feel I, I, I feel like VCs are sometimes uh, like a hidden treasure of information, and you said it like you see five pitches a day. I don't know how many decks a day. It doesn't really matter unless you want to put up numbers. Uh, uh, do you see a pattern of something that works when it comes to dev tools? Is it like a channel, a growth hack, or is it? literally just kind of figuring out a, a product and, and a fl flywheel motion that kind of perpetually works? Or is, it, is there something, a hack or something uh, that you think uh, might work or have heard of uh, many, many times? Yeah, I mean, I think when it comes to dev tools, of course, I mean, in our portfolio, our, our portfolio is like a very early stage, right? I mean, we've yeah. been investing in f from this fund from, for like, I don't know, at most two years, three years. Um, but I, I can tell, like, the, especially the, the project, open source companies that I've, I've seen, of course, like, there are some patterns. Well, the one is that, I, of course, like, the content, right? I mean, the developers love content. But again, like, focusing on individual developers wouldn't, um, you know, at least like, make, make your startup skyrocket it. Of course, like, there's, there's a playbook for, for making it an enterprise focus, um, focus project, which is like, you know, like just giving the giving the opportunity for them to self-host it, or, or um, 
you know, building some, you know, regulatory or security layer on top of it or, and I, I think that this works for, for almost all startups. Um, but yeah, I, I think I, I don't have any more comments on it. Like, I, I think this is pretty much it. As well as so I in your experience, is it at least important to start thinking early on about sales or, or do you guys don't care? No, no, no. I, I, I think it always, at, at least like almost uh, the majority of the times, uh, you start uh, building something based on developer adoption. Because at the end of the day, although they will not the ones that will pay for your product, they will do, they will be the ones who will use it and contribute to it. Especially if you are open sourcing it, um, so they, they will they will be the ones that that, that will become a part part of the team. So of of course, um, focusing on individual developers is like the starting point. Okay. When you invest in, in like companies from this area, let's call it C, whatever, let's call it Europe, I don't care. Uh, no, I'm not going to call it that. Uh, <laughs> let's call it Europe. Uh, uh, is the end goal always US? US? Like, uh, does it become inevitable that every single company you, ra you can invest in this part of the world just is expected to end up going to US? Whatever that means, either physically, either you know, people-wise, either sales-wise, whatever it is, uh, is that the expectation? I, I think all-wise. <laughs> okay, all-wise. <laughs> right. um, but yeah, I mean, of course, like the, especially in our portfolio, you, you can see teams that start locally because, uh, of course, like starting lo locally is al always like easier, almost always e uh, easier because there's this very good talent still in in Central Eastern Europe. I mean, you you are the one who who is hiring like all the time, so you should <laughs> you should comment on it. But I, I, I will, think still I still the talent pool is still legit here. So yeah, I mean, almost all of our portfolio companies start locally. Of course, we have some diaspora deals, but generally this is the case. Um, but yeah, of course, like as, as at least like as 500 emerging Europe, we can we can sell the idea of going to as, as San Francisco and start your sales because, and this this is um, at least like in terms of culture, in terms of how how they work, in terms of connecting with them. I I think it's always um, what what we wish them to do, and what we actually motivate them to do, and we actually provide a lot of tools for them. And we have we have a big network. Uh, we have accelerator program. If they are like super early, we, they can they can use this opportunity to go to SF and like at least um, create some playground for themselves. But of course, like I even if you are like at the moment, if you, even if you are like a super early stage open source company focusing on individual developers, trying to get ad adoption from them, trying to get like a lot contribution uh, as much contribution as possible from them. I think you need to um, think about the enterprise sales as early as possible because this is, again, like these are the corporations that will pay you and, yeah. <laughs> I agree. Uh, Matia, for you, we live in, in, in the same question can go to, to Amir as well. We live in this like remote first world. Everybody's kind of staying at home and, and, and working from home. Uh, uh, but I still feel like even though we have access to engineering here, I, f I still feel like building a dev, dev tool from Europe is just like incrementally harder than, than doing it, especially in the Bay Area. Uh, do you feel like, you know, it's even possible talent wise? Do you, do you think you could attract enough uh, like global top talent that can help you scale the company and the dev tool on a global level? Mm, I mean, in my experience, yes. So, you know, we haven't had both employees from Croatia and from the US. So I think especially for DevTools, it's kind of easier because, you know, everybody's used to everything being on online, hacker news. And I mean, YC was a big help here because I think, it, you know, it's kind of like a stamp on, on you. Right? Yeah, because yeah. somebody says, ah, they're a YC company. I know what's going on. I know they're legit. So actually our first employee ever was, you know, just from the US. So he just applied and, you know, we, we started. So he heard about you through YC? Right? Uh, yes, I think it was Hacker News and he liked the idea. We had a chat and, you know, previously he was at Red Hat, NetApp, like bigger enterprise companies. So for us, it wasn't, uh, wasn't an issue. I should have went with YC. <laughs> uh, okay, so, so you, you think it is possible? Uh, yeah, sure. Like, I mean, I even, you know, obviously the benefit here is that we have uh, talent and, you know, like uh, the whole cost of life is more affordable, which reflects on everything. So I think that's kind of an unfair advantage okay. that he here, right here. 
What Even you? Know, often there is an advice actually not to come to SF because how are you going to hire? I mean, I agree. <laughs> what do you think? Your, your question was pretty specific. Uh, can I build a product here? And I think we can build a product, but I don't think we are building a product. I think I, I, I think, think I said scale it. Scale, scale a product. Yeah. Yeah. I, scale, I go, said scale a developer tool. So go go in the same direction. I think the, the question is, can you build a company from here? I think it's easy to build a developer tool and the product here in this region. Uh, but lack of talent is not on building a product. Lack, lack of talent is on selling the product and creating a company that is globally uh, competitive. And I think this is where you need to build a product here, but then build a company uh, somewhere where you have access to it. And, I mean, just a, a, a simple example is uh, we both had joint experience in performance marketing yeah. and um, we, we worked together uh, on that for uh, for Treble. And in Croatia, and especially in the region, it's very hard to find people that did uh, performance marketing um, for global uh, product, uh, which means uh, understanding how to target different uh, ethnicities, different uh, regions with different uh, messages, how to vary that message. Uh, here is basically, you know, just uh, put uh, some kind of picture on uh, Google uh, Ads and hope <laughs> that uh, things will perform. Exactly. I think it's, it's much more uh, nuanced than that. And I, I don't think that uh, experience is here, you have to go somewhere else. Uh, but building a product, yes, you can do it here. I agree. And there are like, to your point, I totally agree that this part of Europe, I would, uh, I'm, I'm not going to say this probably, so I'm just going to sugarcoat it. Between Europe or Croatia and SF, maybe I would pick Croatia uh, uh, more often than not. Uh, let's just put it that way. But there are advantages of being in SF. Like when you go there, you can randomly bump into, like I was at five guys, met a guy that was standing behind me. He's like a really talented uh, uh, hiring recruiter that kind of landed us a couple of really great uh, SDRs and stuff like that. I, I probably wouldn't meet that guy in this country maybe but maybe not right so so there are some opportunities as well as i think the mindset like if you drive uh, me and tia were in sf in october i think two times or, or or something like that like when you drive on the highway all the ads are like ai this rider ai twilio ai the ads on our highways are like toilet paper, right? Or something like that. So political part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> political part. Uh, so there is a slight push, you know, uh, uh, when it comes to mindset, like you just have to, you, you, everybody is kind of in it uh, uh, a lot more there. Um, I don't wanna, let's, let's continue with you, Amir. Like if you had to go back in time and kind of change or adjust one thing uh, in terms of product, launch, sales, go to market, anything you did uh, as part of uh, Kubernetes, what is it that that will be? Same question, Mati, I'll give you more time to think. So I, I wouldn't build, build a mock-up product. I would just uh, create a video <laughs> of uh, okay. uh, something that I, that I would be able to show to the investors. It would be much shorter and uh, cheaper. <laughs> Why? Uh, because there's, did no, you ever, there's did you... no difference between uh, a <laughs> video and the mock -up. Did you give a demo? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, our mock. Do you want to see a demo of a product? Like... No, she she has seen it. Yeah. But... No, generally, like, do you like seeing a demo of, of a product? I mean, if if there's a demo, of course. But and if not there's a video, uh, I mean, I can watch it myself. Okay. Yeah, I mean, th th there's no there's no value in building a mock-up uh, product because the, it's no different than a video. You're just presenting the idea and the, what you have in mind. It's not like it's working, scaling, or you know, performing anything else than uh, video. And you can do video in a day, and you need two months to, to create a mock-up. So you know, kind of, kind of so from, from that perspective, we wouldn't do that again. And the second thing, uh, we would definitely have a, a product uh, ready in MVP phase before starting to spend time with um, uh, VCs. Um, and maybe I would have a couple of uh, clients uh, uh, along that. Uh, but uh, also, so you would change I mean, everything. <laughs> 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 no, but this is like a span of two months uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. up and down. Yeah. It's pretty short time. Yeah, uh, time I agree. Different. So I would also invest in observability two years ago. Wouldn't pick SVB as my bank and a lot of other other things. But yeah, I, I, I get it. I get it. What about you, Maria? Uh, so the question is like when to start fundraising or what is exactly? What, change in what would you process? change? So you've been running mm, uh, yeah. uh, was for, for quite some time. I'm sure you like we all make mistakes. That's like I'm not, you know, that's a given. Uh, what is it that you would change uh, or at least one or two things that you sure, think? Sure, sure. No, for us, I mean, you know, I think that actually what you said, like it's it's best not to go chasing after funds as early as possible because it's not it's going to be too early. But on the other hand, for YC, it's the best to apply as early as possible. Really? And you probably won't get in, but you will get on their radar. 
because you know, it's kind of funny because people are always amazed. I mean, kind of wonder why does YC interview takes only 10 minutes? And you know, if you, if you get in, they pay you $500,000 $500, right now. But the trick is that most of the companies, more than 50% actually get in after applying multiple times. So your interview is not 10 minutes, your interview is last half year mm -hmm. from your last application. So that's actually how it works. And you know, it's, it's never too early to apply for YC and basically you will just get on the radar and they will be able to track your progress. Yeah, and also like the application process is really legit. Like they, they actually give you a form. You can kind of yeah. structure your own idea. Like will, will this work? Or who is this for? Um, so yeah, I, I think it's yeah, really, it, really it's important. A, it's a very well designed form and basically helps you think about what you, what you need to have. You also applied multiple times, right? As uh, yes, we applied three times. Yeah. Yes. Uh, cool. Uh, was that an in-person one or was it the uh, First one was in-person and the, the rest two were online. Did you go there just because of the... Uh, first time, yes. And you got rejected? Yes. How did you feel? Fine. And you it's applied only <laughs> 10 minutes, right? The only, only 10 minutes. We had two interviews. So you so flew about 15 hours. Yes. For 10 minutes. Okay. And they pay for everything. Oh, they do? Oh. Yes. Was it business? <laughs> Economy <laughs> business. <laughs> uh, maybe that was a test, but yeah, yeah. Uh, I actually started filling out the web form when it was COVID and probably like midway, I was like, dude, this is just so many questions. I don't want to write this down. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I and I have the application. I never submitted it. I I, I think it was like I wanted to say too many things, and uh, uh, talking to ECs was much easier than kind of writing it down. Uh, Tunya, for you, I, I think they've shared kind of their piece of advice, which I, I, I in both cases totally agree. Uh, like even if you don't get get investors excited the first time, maybe you'll do it like second, third time. What is one piece of advice that you would like to share with anybody building a developer tool uh, that might help them kind of become a better company, raise rounds faster, or, or generally position themselves uh, a bit better? I think the only advice that I can give, and I, I think I've seen this again from, from founders that, that are in my network and also from our portfolio companies, is that and build, just build, start building what you believe as soon as, as early as possible. And um, I think like, although, again, I think this resonates with the last, last answer that I gave. Um, although like focus on the developer adoption like individually and probably you are the one also like the customer of this tool like in the, at the beginning, but I think al almost like, on, like ninety percent of the times of these all all of these developer tools, it will not look like the one that you started start with. Uh, just be aware of that because you'll unfortunately, even though I, if you like like it or not, you'll start building it for for enterprises and <laughs> you'll you'll need to get some money. Although I mean, even if um, even if you're like at the moment uh, would like to be the customer of this tool, probably you will not be. The, the so, so the I, I, I previously future. said founders are <laughs> buying time until they figure it out. So basically what you're saying is if you're a dev tool founder, you're just raising rounds, buying time until you accept the fact that you're going to go enterprise. <laughs> I mean, I, I think, I, yeah, this is the ugly truth. <laughs> realization. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Uh, <laughs> well, th that's why we have these meetups. Uh, a uh, last uh, round of questions before we open it uh, uh, for for any of you. By the way, feel free to ask any questions. I'm sure anybody will will answer it. Uh, uh, some of you answered uh, uh, my my questions, but I wanted to individually ask it. So I'll start with Amir uh, because Mati answered uh, a question, so I have to figure one out for him. Uh, how was it for you personally, like transitioning from a sales driven organization? like InfoBip, let's just call it sales driven. I don't want to get into the semantics. I think it is. Uh, and and kind of moving into Kubernetes, which I guess is a more bottom up uh, uh, developer led uh, uh, kind of path. Well, my job is in InfoBip was not the, the sales part. Uh, I was more part of the engineering world. Although I did the sales. Um, so, so what I did there, we were uh, trying to, to create a product that uh, telecoms uh, would like to host so that we can uh, create uh, uh, transit of messages for our sales to, to sell. 
So my part of the organization was heavily uh, engineering uh, driven, and then uh, my job as sales was to understand what these operators would be ready to host within the um, within the, their environment. And in a way, it was uh, bottom up because I never tried to, to go you know to hire management and then uh, try to talk them into pushing the idea down to um, operations. It was more like uh, how we can help to the operations to achieve their goals. Uh, typically, goal would be to create some kind of revenue, and out of that, how we can create a product that would help them. To achieve those those goals so in, in that sense it's kind of uh, similar and i actually wanted to to retain this um, uh, possibility to uh, design a product through the sales process and for me those two things are really similar and i think that was one of the uh, secrets to info uh, success was really strong engineering well it seems now as a really strong sales organization i don't think it's a it's strong sales organization margins are pretty tight uh sms is being sold as commodity and i think it's pretty strong engineering organization that's allowing uh, uh not really skillful sales to, to actually scale up and uh, do a lot of uh, work and that's kind of uh, view from the from the inside i think uh you know, I wouldn't agree. It's a sales organization. I think they're. Doing, I do. I, that's why I pretty, said pretty I'm going to say crap it's job a, in, in sales. And it, I, I was actually offended uh, a lot of times that something <laughs> that you would do, you know, really nice on the engineering side, they would sell for nothing. Yeah. Uh, well, at least uh, from based on your stories, like they sent you across the world to sell services. Yeah, that's that's. Uh, uh, so that uh, nobody sends me across the world to that's, send that, trouble. That's true. I've been uh, uh, in many know? places in war zones. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, Matia, my original question to you was how hard it is to get to YC. You've, you've kind of answered that. Maybe a part two of that question would then be something that I always wondered. YC is probably well, like one of the prestigious kind of investors out there. Uh, and you've said that you kind of get a lot of uh, uh, push from just being, having that stamp. Is it really worth it? Like what kind of experience uh, uh, was it so far? Uh, for you, besides hiring, anything that you'd like to specifically highlight? Is it like the network? Is it uh, help from all of these guys? Is it whenever you do a launch on Product Hunt, Michael Siebel is your hunter. Uh, share with friends. We're all friends here. <laughs> so, yeah. No, I think, you know, like uh, there are multiple aspects of YC. And people sometimes think, you know, because they have the whole program of three months, right? Which, which is great, especially if you're a first-time founder and, you know, you, you haven't encountered a lot of startup terms before. But for example, we had a startup before and we were following YC a lot. So I would say like a lot of what they're going to teach you is actually online. I mean, you know, there is no secret they are keeping only for themselves because no, nobody can help you, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the same, I would say, you know, the, the most, uh, like two biggest benefits of YC are basically that stamp you get, you know, which helps a lot with fundraising, not in the sense it's going to raise around for you, but you can get an interest with pretty much any investor you want, right? The rest is on you, but it's much easier to get to talk to whoever you want, right? So that's one side, and the other side is the community, what you said. Because, you know, basically, of course, there's Michael Seibel, but he's no developer. He doesn't know how to help you with the specifics of your developer tools. But you have like all of, all the bunch of companies who were doing open source before, like you know GitLab, Superbase, or just engineering from Airbnb, DoorDash, and similar. And of course, you can use that network, reach out to people, talk to them. So there is you know a vast pool of knowledge that you can tap into. Did you did you use uh, that network at any point in time? Oh, of course. I mean, we are connected. There is like a special branch for open source startups. You know, we can all chat, uh, exchange knowledge, is help, that help like each a other. Slack channel or. Uh, there is Slack, uh, internal platform, like all kinds of, uh, of services, yes. Cool, interesting. Is there a secret handshake? Yes, <laughs> of course, open source handshake. Uh, uh, so it's not secret. Uh, <laughs> uh, probably the reason why we didn't get into YC is he's more buff than we are. Like, yes, that's actually the, it's, yeah, it's yeah, the only factor <laughs> they, they look at. Uh, uh, so, Tunya, uh, uh, a question specifically for you. Uh, uh, you know, you and I have talked about it a bit, but I feel like you have a lot of faith in this uh, region, and I'll say specifically even in Croatia. Uh, like, what makes you excited about Croatia? Uh, like, is it technical talent? Is it people? Is it something else? Why? 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 <laughs> Of course, uh, the technical talent for sure. I, I think you might be the first Croatian founder that I might. Uh, like talk. I don't know. That's up yeah. To you. I mean, I, I I think it was my se second month or so uh, in the fund. Uh, like also one of the first founders, and also it was also probably my like third VC meeting. <laughs> so. Um, so yeah, I mean, I I think uh, you, my my meeting with you was my realization. That, oh yeah, I mean, there's this technical talent here, and I I need to discover it more. So I I think 
I might be uh, the you know the f first person to cover Croatia in in our fund. Of course, like we 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 were getting deal deal flow, that we were covering it, but we were also like a very small team, so no one was co covering like a particular a, a particular country. But I I, I kind of you know started covering this with, with actually kind of you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, but yeah, I mean. Um, as as soon as I got to you know get get a re regular deal flow and like travel to, travel to Croatia, I kind of realized that yes, I, my, my hypothesis was right. Um, there's this huge technical talent here, and I, not only I talk to founders, but I also sometimes talk to to developers, builders, uh, operators in you know companies like Infobip or you know in other startups. And uh, yeah, I mean I think it, my hypothesis was true, but also. Um, the technical talent signals for a lot of things, but first and foremost, I think I mean, we, we are having this switch uh, in, in terms of how you can sell your product from, from, from a core technology to building even like further on top of it. Um, so I think like the service level agreements will not be based on what you what you create in terms of numbers or in terms of like line of codes or how big you process the data, etc. But also I think it will be much much more like based on what you create as a value, like a perceived value for for others. So I think technical talent is much more important here because I mean you can you can. I think like right now, especially with, for example, like with generative AI, the technology itself, like the core technology itself is becoming more and more um, as a commodity. Like you can like just just yesterday, GPT has announced like a much bigger context uh, LLM. And right now you can like take it and build or build process like much bigger amount of data and they, they will keep doing that. And I think that like, incumbents will not be your competition, rather like your part partner or, or your um, or like a collaborator so I, I think technical talent is really important because although like maybe you're, you're an employee of a, of a startup or like a builder or, or a contributor of something and you're working for an enterprise in the same at the same time you're aware of these core technologies and it, it means that in the future in the near future in two three years you can start building around it or on top of it so uh, although maybe um, we are talking about a very scarce pool, uh, there is not not like so many developers that I can invest. Uh, I mean, the, really, like it's no, a, no. even it like is. it's a small country. Of course, like there are more and more opportunities every day, and it will be more. But I think you can base your decision, this kind of a decision, not only you know based on the number of founders, or, but you know n number of talent, the volume of talent, and I, I think this is like very promising. Maybe quality of founders. Hmm? Maybe quality of founders, not money. Yes, of, of course, but you know, like the, the, the huge tech talent signals for that because it will it will be based on how how we can build. And if you are working for you know good startups, then uh, this means that you have like much more potential of building something that you're at least like at the moment I using. I agree. Thank all, uh, all three of you. I really appreciate you coming down, sharing your thoughts. Uh, we have some time. I know uh, everybody can smell the pizzas, but uh, uh, if any of you have any questions for anybody, we have this fake mic because I didn't want to pay for uh, a sound system. I will in the future, but not today. Uh, so you'll, you'll be handed a mic. Uh, it's only for YouTube, but we, we can all hear you. Anybody has any questions to any of us, uh, please feel free. So my my question is for Tunya. Uh, you were talking about mistakes and regrets, and if you started it all over, uh, what would you do differently? But nobody asked Tunya, <laughs> what would she do differently? Uh, so I'm interested in like what's your biggest fail? For example, if you can talk about something that you thought like, oh my god, this is gonna be a brilliant idea this is going to be like amazing and then it wasn't or something like that when you started first working at a fund when you didn't uh, discover github stars and all that so in the beginning what was your like biggest mistake failures or something that you can share i think i mean uh, i might have mentioned it like a few t few more times in the past i think um not only me, but also like I, I think my team. I, I'm super confident that we don't have like big regrets. 
uh, and I don't think it, there will be because I mean all of us are aware of, aware that like this is this is the riskiest riskiest asset that you can operate, right? I mean venture capital is like very risky, and we know like we whenever we invest in a company. We will do our best to support it, support the founders, uh, not, not only from, from a capital perspective, but you know, as, as much as they need us or in, in as many contexts that they need us. Uh, so I, don't I think I don't have any regrets. Um, but I mean, at least I, I don't have any regrets from, <laughs> I don't have any regrets from the ones that I did or we did. I think we, have, we will have or we have <laughs> Regrets <laughs> from the ones that we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. <laughs> it, it happens, and uh, I think you, you gain experience like uh, over time. Uh, whenever uh, like we we miss a deal, or whenever we happen not invest in a, in a company, I take this, especially if it's my deal. Uh, I, I take this as my failure to not push it like. Uh, as much as I can, although I do my best. That is true. I do my, <laughs> that is true. <laughs> I, I do my best, but uh, I always like, um, like we as a team, like we, we decide on deals like together. And uh, if we happen to not invest in a company that's like become, become successful or like raise like a very, from, from good investors, this, this means that we missed the round. And I, I take this as my failure and I take this as a, as a lesson for myself. And I move on. But we, we, we are all aware, of, aware that this is like the, I think this is the industry that opens, that, that, that is open to mistakes the most. Uh, I have a question for uh, Amir. Uh, we all know that WeWork failed uh, bankrupt. So I guess, uh, is there any plans for expanding Vespa? <laughs> <laughs> Seizing that market share, now it's wide open. Yeah, <laughs> yeah actually, you have one successful startup, you're right. Uh, so, so Vespa is now generating revenue. Uh, we'll actually do uh, close to 2 million uh, euros this year. And uh, we've decided to try to fundraise uh, next year for, uh, for Vespa and uh, expand it. But direction of expansion would be somewhere in Europe. Uh, I have this idea that um, Croatia is missing some kind of bridge, um, infrastructure bridge between uh, the country and the rest of the Europe. And we'd like to take uh, Vespa concept as the, the kind of bridge to have startups start in Croatia, but then if they want to go and try selling in Germany, they will have location, they will have uh, support. Um, and I think this is what, um, you know. Uh, Basically, we were. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't agree. We work business model uh, was based on a um, uh, purchase of large uh, quantity of space and difference between yeah. what they're renting and uh, uh, what they're paying for. And that's not sustainable uh, long run. I think the uh, difference is that, for example, we are charging our space um, five times more than the market average, which was not the case for uh, WeWork. And we can uh, do that because we are adding a lot of uh, value to actual space itself and uh, the strategy on, on that startup. <laughs> so at least I have one which is, uh, <laughs> uh, which is working. Right. So, so no lavish parties when you fundraise or? Uh, no, there will be a lavish party every year. <laughs> yeah. You have to stop wearing shoes though. Why? <laughs> because you know the WeWork guy famously walked around New York with no shoes. Yeah, I'm preparing so I have yeah, these, uh, how, how it's called barefoot shoes. Yeah, he yeah, these are barefoot shoes, you know. The transition. <laughs> <laughs> you get there. Uh, I would just like to chime in with a comment on WeWork. So WeWork was actually profitable in 2014 because they were, they were. <laughs> when they started. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Because they were uh, renting out places uh, long term and then they were selling it to companies short term and they were basically uh, the middleman and collecting uh, solid income, I would say. But then with this global expansion, especially with the investment from SoftBank of uh, 10 billion, there was need to grow at an incredible pace. And that's what, what uh, killed them. But it was a profitable business in 2014. Yeah, but, but by the way, there, there's, there's different angle to, uh, to what we're doing uh, with Vespa. I think we have discovered a uh, different value to the market because they were uh, uh, buying cheap and then selling uh, more expensive. But I think where uh, current uh, value in that market is, is to create a synergy for existing businesses between co-working and uh, their current space. So like a hybrid uh, extension of the existing 
uh, workspace. And this is this is actually where we get uh, a lot of interest with uh, with Vespa because people uh, can actually change how they are uh, how they are using current capacity of the office. They don't uh, have to move because they can outsource uh, things they are doing occasionally to concepts like uh, like Vespa. And it's completely different than uh, we were. Okay. Go ahead. I have a question for Matia, actually. Uh, did you have to convince YC that uh, your company will be able to return 100x or whatever it is? Or did they were just like, okay, this is useful, this might have potential in the future, let's see what's going to be? Uh, yeah, I think the, the main prerequisite is market size. Because if the market is not big enough, even if you succeed, then basically there is no case for, for venture funding. So that's the first thing. And you know, with developer tools and web development, that, that was covered. And then the rest is you know, just painting the picture why you will be able to cover that, that, that market. Oh, okay. Anybody else has any? OK, cool. Go ahead. A serious question, please. Uh, it's also from Matteo. <laughs> no, we work with. <laughs> yeah. uh, how do you plan to earn money with uh, Product that is uh, also framework, no hard question. open source, <laughs> and targeting developers. No, actually, actually, it's very, it's very easy question, and that's also you know one of the things that uh, were kind of you know the, what they taught us at YC. Basically, don't invent anything which is already invented. So, you know, open source model is by now you know quite proven, and you know the best thing you can do is you know kind of just you know find, look at the role models, and see what works for you. So for us, it's example, Terraform or HashiCorp is a good role model, Mongo, for example, and Databricks, for example, also, right? I mean, to keep it short, the main routes are basically selling services on top, for example, in hosting deployment area, and on the other side, you know, you can go on the kind of, let's say, enterprise features route. Okay. Cool. I don't think he's convinced. <laughs> if he's not a VC, that's fine. <laughs> uh, quality <laughs> Actually, just to continue on that, but for Tunia, when you're looking at the companies that are building developer tools, do you prefer open source or closed source companies? Is there? We, we don't have any preparation, of course. Like it, it, it can, it, it depends, right? I mean, there are, there are, like, as as Matia said, like open source model is kind of proven, like in the past. Um, but also, like that, there are like new, new models. Um, so, for example, like, like what Vectara does, right? I mean, they kind of, I mean, the, uh, the founder of, of Vectara is, I think, a Cla Cladera's founder as well. So he, he kind of competed with AWS in the, in the past. So what, what he did was to, you know, just make people pay for the core itself because it's like, at least like they are really, really confident that the technology is like very proprietary one. But they actually build some build a periphery around it, and actually they kind of opened it to to the ones who are paying for for the core. So there are like a few models, of course. Uh, but yeah, I mean we don't have a preparation. But of course, if you are really confident that your technology is a c proprietary one, of course, like you can open so um, open periphery. It. But if you uh, think that this can be the basis and um, this should be open source and this should be, co be contributed by, you know, the other uh, outside developers, then you, you can open source it. I think it's all only based on logic and how, how you explain it and how you visionize the company. But we are, we are all open to all, all of these cases. As long as it's generating revenue. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> or, or GitHub stars. GitHub <laughs> stars. Uh, <laughs> Any, anybody else? Cool. Uh, it's pizza time. Uh, so uh, they'll take out the pizzas here. You can eat, again, drink. And again, really appreciate the three of you and everybody else uh, for coming. And any feedback that you, you can share, anybody with, with this badge, just tell them it was good, bad, we sucked. We always like to kind of uh, be better. Okay. Constructive criticism. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.